Good morning from Hoplong Hollow. This is Jerry. We're going to start in the garden this morning and then move on to the kitchen to make something really delicious. An update on the pea planting. In February, I planted peas using several different methods. These ones were directly sown in place in the garden. And I covered them in the beginning with little glass cloches to keep them safe. They're perfectly fine now. They don't need any protection at all. These are edible peas, not sweet peas. These are sweet uh, magnolia peas and green beauty. Let's take a look at what happened with the sweet peas. The results from the deep root trainers planted at the very same time as the other peas. I'm not impressed at all. This is the second time I've used the deep root trainers and I was not impressed the first time either. So here we have our planter, our trough planter, which has got a trellis directly behind it for the sweet peas to climb. So I've planted them directly along the edge at the same time as everybody else underneath these plastic little glass cloches that I made just by drilling these air holes and water holes in the top. And we don't need these anymore. The peas are doing very well. These are royal sweet peas from Everwild Farms, doing great. Okay, now for the mini greenhouses. These were planted at the same time as everybody else. And look at those. <laughs> My goodness, those are really, really good. Look at that. Aren't they gorgeous? And these, once again, are the royal peas. The royal sweet peas getting a little mossy in there. I might want, you know, I could take these and put these in the garden right now. And it just might do it. I am really, really pleased with these results. So, planting directly in the ground or planting in the mini greenhouse was the most successful thing for me. Ah, isn't it great? Oh, sweet peas at last. Well, we'll just see if we can get them all the way to the flowering stage. Just look at the difference between the deep root trainers and the mini greenhouses. I love it. I love it because these are so much easier for me. And here we have the results of about half of the mini greenhouses. I didn't open the other once there are about 15 more i didn't open them yet because they're not doing as well as these they were mostly perennials and things that take a lot longer to germinate but so far i'm pretty happy with the success of these so from canterbury bells to yarrow to english wallflowers pinks loving a mist black hollyhocks um, scented stock and bergamot ah and i don't know what that one is over there oh yeah, a special kind of larkspur that I haven't planted before called uh, rocket larkspur. Looks different than the larkspur I have in the garden right now, so I'm thinking it's going to be just a little bit fuller. So I am so glad that I created these Hop Along Hollow mini greenhouses, and they are just fantastic. They hold a lot more than those milk jugs do, and they're so convenient. Now I'm going to close these up again because I'm going to let them get a little bit bigger while I prepare some garden space for them because I don't really want to put them out just yet. We'll close these back up again and put them right back in their spot in the potager, and I will let them just continue to grow in place.
obviously everybody doesn't want to plant from seed. So let's talk a little bit about bedding plants. And bedding plants are simply the plants that you buy in the nursery or the box store that come in the little six, four, and twelve packs. And by the time they get to the store, they are pretty good size. And these you plant directly into your garden. When it comes to planting in the garden, I'm really not a purist. Everything doesn't have to be planted from seed by me. If I can find a deal somewhere, whether it's online or in a box store or a nursery or even sometimes on Craigslist, you can get some good deals. If I can find them for plants, I will take them. A perfect example are pansies. These come from a local um, little rural farm store that we have here. There are 12 healthy pansies in here and they were nine dollars. So for nice healthy plants that can go directly into your garden right now, this is a great deal. Sure, I can plant some pansy seeds in here as well and I hope they take the more the merrier but this is a great way to do it and especially if you have trouble growing something and let me show you something I have the worst time getting to go to bloom now I didn't have much success in this mini greenhouse with my snapdragons but that's not unusual for me I have had terrible luck with snapdragons. The germination right here is really bad. The seeds were a little aged, but nevertheless, I have just never done well planting snapdragons from seed. I'm not ever going to give up. I'll still sprinkle some seed in with my bedding plants, but since I got a good deal on the snaps, I'm not taking any chances. I'm planting the bedding plants this year in the garden. Here we have 12 snapdragons, nice tall snapdragons so far. They're not the super tall ones that I really, really want to grow, but they're pretty enough. And these were a pack of 12 for, with tax about $12, making this a dollar a plant. Let's take a look at the plants. They're just very nice little root system. I'm just going to amend the soil a little bit and pop these right into the garden. I'm not taking any chances with snapdragons this year. I'm just going to plant them from the bedding plants. I'm going to tell beginner gardeners something that they're not going to want to do. It's just something I do and you don't have to, but I think it really works. So you've got this beautiful little bloom on the top of your snapdragon and you know what I'm going to do with that? I'm going to pop it off. Snap its little head right off. That's right, I'm going to take it right off. <laughs> Why am I going to do that? This is an annual. Now, you're not going to do this with perennials. Just do this with annuals. I've popped its head off because this is a, a lanky, going to be a long, lanky plant, and I want a nice, bushy plant with lots and lots of blooms. So here's one I snapped off the flower blooms off the top as soon as I got it. And I've already got one, two, three, four, five, six, or at least a dozen little lateral branches coming out, which will all produce blooms for me. So the blooms won't just be on the top, they'll be all over the plant. Well, you don't have to do that, but I just feel that it really helps. And with annuals, they're going to bloom for you all season long because they only have one blooming time. And the more you pick the flowers, the more flowers you get. And don't worry about all those beautiful little blooms going to waste because you popped them off. Because you can always press them. Just press them between the pages of a book. And you can use them for all sorts of reasons. Now here's another hint for beginner gardeners. As your plants are growing in your garden and you do not want them to produce seed. You just want them to keep producing flowers. You want to go along. Whenever a plant, a flower has faded out, you just want to take it off because that's, that's called deadheading and you are simply keeping the plant from producing seed. You want it to produce more and more flowers. At the end of the season, you can leave them on and they'll drop seed for you. But wait till the season is over so that you will have constant blooms all throughout the spring and summer. And here's another wee bit of advice that I learned from experience when I was a new gardener. If you only have limited funds and you can't buy everything, 
it's very tempting to just go buy one of each plant. Well, if you do that, you're not going to have any cohesion in your garden. So take your time, choose two plants that look really great together, like these little violets are going to look great with these pale pink snapdragons. Then plant them very close together. These are six to eight inches apart. When they fill in, they'll make a nice, nice mound of flowers, and this whole space will be filled in. This is just a little pocket next to the gate but this is a nice little entryway. So don't plant them in a straight line like little tin soldiers. Spread them around as if it's more natural and give them room to grow, of course. But still, you want to have a beautiful showing that uh, is very coordinated and beautiful. So here in this little pocket of the potager next to the gate, we've planted those beautiful little violets and snapdragons and then to unify it, we also put some right over here on the other side of the sidewalk. And just for some extra, extra measure, we've got a lot of extra snapdragons. These are the seeds that didn't do very well in the trays, so I'm not going to waste them in trays anymore. I'm just going to sprinkle these in the garden and see what happens. With some seeds, direct sowing really is the way to go. But you never know unless you experiment in your own area. So you can take half your seeds and try to plant them in pots, and you can take half your seeds and sow them right into the garden. Now when it comes to buying bedding plants as opposed to seed, the same could apply to vegetables. These little uh, eight pepper plants here, all beautiful specialty peppers, red peppers and yellow peppers, got at the local farm store and paid about 50 cents just James and I. We don't have a lot of people to feed here. We don't need a big crop of peppers or anything else. So this for me is the best way to do it. Now I do have some specialty peppers that I want to plant. Now because I can't get these as young plants at the farm store, these I will plant from seed because this is a specialty pepper for me. I've also got some beautiful little banana peppers that are all whole different colors of the rainbow that I collected seed from last year and those I'll plant from seed as well, probably directly in the garden. Peppers like the heat. They really love the heat. And since we are still haven't had our last frost date here in East Tennessee, I have the cloches here in case we find out the temperature is going to go be no, below 30. I will pop the cloches over the top of the peppers to protect them from the frost. Some of you have asked about these plastic cloches that I have been using, and these are pretty terrific. Uh, glass would be so much prettier and more authentic, but also extremely expensive and breakable and difficult to store. These stack right on top of each other when you're finished with them. Now, I like the fact that they have these air holes at the top, which you can close to keep out freezing temperatures. These are basically just to protect your plants during the cold periods before the true gardening season begins. I used a lot of these to get these plants going straight into the beds, and including the arugula right here. I never would have been able to get it started that quickly if it weren't. For these cloches. Secure it into the ground with the little metal posts that come with them. And I believe I paid about $25 for six of these. These are the large ones, 10 inches in diameter. You can also get them six inches in diameter and four inches in diameter. You can get these at really good garden centers, but I got these on Amazon. So they've come in really handy for me. I really love the look of garden cloches, and despite the fact that these are plastic, that is actually an, an advantage in this case because they're stackable, easy to store away, reusable for many, many years, and they just look good in the garden. I also bought my broccoli as bedding plants, also another really good deal. This is also a cold hardy vegetable, which means it likes the cold, and it will actually be okay in temperatures in the 30s and even lower. Here's an example of some succession planting. 
in one raised bed. Now, what do I mean by succession planting for beginner gardeners? I mean that there's always something growing in this bed. So when one thing does its some um, life cycle and disappears, something else comes up in its place. So the first thing that we always get are the muscari, the beautiful little grape hyacinths growing along the edges here. I planted lettuce seeds right here in this strip. In the middle, we have elephant garlic, and that will grow for a very long time and develop these fantastically beautiful flower heads. In the back are daffodils that haven't opened up yet and some other bulbs. And when those are gone, I'm putting Swiss chard along the edge here. So there's always going to be something growing in this bed. Another example of succession planting is in this raised bed where I put the sweet peas and the blueberries and the tulip bulbs. So first of all, we've got the tulips. And here they are beginning to put on their magnificent show. But I also planted seed in here, poppy seed, California poppies, and blue Euro poppies. Those will bloom in early spring and then they will be gone with the wind. Along the edge here, I planted spinach seed. So all along the edge we'll have spinach. When the tulips are gone, I will put in the Swiss chard. I'll have Swiss chard growing in a lot of places because we do eat a lot of salad here. And the peas, bless their little hearts. Just look at them. I'm so pleased with my peas. I can't tell you. But <laughs> I think they're a 60-day crop. Outside, just outside this bed, up against the timbers, is antique cast iron fencing. And that is to be used as a trellis for these little sugar bond peas growing down here. These peas only grow 12 to 14 inches tall. And so they're perfect for growing outside of the bed and climbing up the cast iron fence. And then, so here in the same spot is another strip that grows right along the sidewalk. This is the brick walkway in the potager. Oh, the beauty of a potager. I just love it because you're mixing so many different things. It's not just one thing. It's not just vegetables and edibles. It's everything from tulips to roses to here we have primroses that are just packed in like crazy. And then we have the little sugar bond peas, the tulips that have been growing here, coming back now for three years, which absolutely surprises me. And then we are putting in those violets and pansies all along the edges here. So every little bit of space can be used in your potager, and every little thing can have something beautiful growing. And so on the end, I just love it when the plants are just backed in like crazy. So these are pansies, violets, primroses, and oh my goodness, here come the oxeye daisies, which are back here in the back. It's a good thing because they're tall. And also you can see the beginnings of the little bits of bee balm coming up. And then we also have another blueberry bush planted there in the corner. You can certainly plan ahead when you're doing a garden bed and decide all the things that will be planted in succession so that you have a continuously growing and green and luscious bed, always full of something delightful. So you may remember in the last video, we sprinkled a lot of seeds in some pots and buckets. And in this bucket, we put forget-me-not seeds, and here they are, doing beautifully. And there are 10 Negrita tulip bulbs in here. I only see four of them emerging. So this should be an interesting result when it finally comes up. We have some of the pellets that are growing black hollyhocks, I believe. And some nasturtiums are coming up. I think these nasturtiums are getting pretty leggy. Of course, it is a vine, and so it's going to be like this. But I think that might be ready to go in. It's cold hardy. I think it'll be all right. The mignonette. And here is the catch fly. 
Here are a few of the things that were placed in the little glass greenhouse so that you can see that it really did its job. It does hold the heat. Now these top pots, which we sprinkled seed in, they were covered with cloches, but the ones below were not. Why do I walk around showing you all these things? It's because if you're a beginner, I want you to know that you can have some successes and you, you, you can have a lot of failures too. I mean, look at this tray right here. This was an expensive zinnia, which is why I planted it in the pellets, and yet I'm not having a great germination right here. And, you know, it just happens. It's, it takes a lot of trial and error and experimentation. So, you know what? Don't ever give up in gardening because you will always find something that you can grow really, really well. One of those things will be tulips. One thing you will very likely have good success with will be your bulbs, your daffodils, your tulips, your alliums, and all the rest of them, your chives, and even your onions, because they're so easy to do. A beginner can grow bulbs, a beginner can grow a beautiful tulip bed, and that's a great place to start if you're just starting out with your gardens plan on those bulbs. Next time we'll talk about roots because roots are also a fantastic way to start a garden. Finally, a perfect rabbit, except for this weird stuff. I don't know what that is. Nope, he's a beauty. Well, you can see by my little chocolates that I am not an experienced candy maker. Mine are a little rough around the edges. But I didn't actually buy these chocolate molds to make chocolate with originally. You can see by these delightful little figures why anybody would enjoy collecting chocolate molds. And they're 
so many uses for them aside from just making chocolate or just sitting on a shelf. But even one little chocolate mold sitting on a shelf with your teapots, can you see this with your, your pink transferware, how beautiful that would be? Just sitting there on a shelf. <laughs> or when you serve tea, a couple chocolate molds on the table are just very sweet and delightful. But let's talk a little bit about chocolate molds because they're actually kind of have an interesting history. When chocolate first became popular, it was always liquefied, and it was consumed as a drink, such as cho hot chocolate or even chocolate tea. And it really wasn't until the 1830s that solid chocolate became available, thanks to Joseph Fry and Sons in the 1830s in England, who began to make a nice, solid chocolate. But it was the French who developed the chocolate mold. In 1832 there was a revolution in chocolate making thanks to jean Patiste Latte in Paris who created a stamped sheet copper chocolate mold in it was a very simple mold lined with silver in order for the chocolate to release from the mold. They were simple shapes probably just little little hearts maybe little squares of chocolate and very small, about an inch in diameter. In the 1840s, the French developed a mold so that every conceivable size and shape and every sort of character could be created with chocolate. A three-dimensional nickel-clad steel mold was created. They also used tin-lined copper they ceased using the silver for obvious reasons. It was too expensive, but the purpose for the lining, the tin lining, would be to release that chocolate from the mold. And hence we had these wonderful, wonderful chocolate molds came into existence. But in the 1860s, Germany outpaced France in the chocolate making trade. A German chocolate maker by the name of Anton Reich became the premier mold maker, creating over 50,000 different chocolate molds from the 1860s and onward. I don't think any of mine are Anton Reich's, but I do know that those are very valuable. Making chocolate beautiful, not only delicious, but absolutely fun and charming to look at. You might not even want to bite into that little chocolate guy right there. This is the only one for me that really turned out well. And this is an antique mold. I have no idea what I paid for it. It does have markings on it that I can barely read right here. But this one looked well. Now they stopped making these nickel-clad molds in the 1960s and they went on to making them in another way, which I will show you. But first of all, let's just talk about what do you look for when you're looking for a chocolate mold. So when you're looking for a chocolate mold, what is it that you're looking for? The main thing is what do you want to use your mold for? If you want to use your mold for making chocolate, you don't want to get a mold with a lot of rust or uh, breaking away of the surface, especially on the inside. That's why I kept looking at the inside of the molds, because if it's got a lot of this wear and tear on the inside, then the lining is gone, or it's going away, and your chocolate will not be released from the mold. So this would be great, just as a collector's piece. Because I don't think I paid a whole lot for this one. Maybe this one was about $39. But this one is quite old and quite this is copper this is absolutely nickel clad copper my friend found this when she was um, antiquing and she just get, gave it to me she paid nine dollars for this and I think it's very very valuable now but I couldn't possibly make chocolate with it because it's it's really bad on the inside another thing you want to look for if you're using these for making chocolate is you see how you can see the light coming through those little spaces there? Well, that's what the clips are for. If you get enough clips on here, you can 
squeeze these pretty tight and close them up. But chocolate will leak out of those areas and you'll have to snip it away with your knife. And that's not always very easy to do. This is absolutely one of my favorite molds and I was hoping that she would turn out really well. She was a little iffy. As you can see here, <laughs> she didn't turn out too great, but she's cute anyway. What would you expect to pay for a chocolate mold? Well, I didn't pay much for this one at all, and you can see it's not in great shape, and it's missing half. It's also got a lot of wear on the inside, which means the chocolate may not hold in there very well. On the other hand, I don't think I paid much more than $6 for this at the time. Here's what you can pay for a chocolate mold. Anywhere from $10 all the way up to thousands of dollars. I don't think I have anything here that's worth thousands of dollars because I would never pay that much. Now another thing you want to look for is if you have all the clips. And there'll be many different kinds of clips. You've got these flat clips. And you've got these sorts of clamps. Uh, really, if you can find one in really great shape, this is probably the nicest one I, I have. And he also made the best, best chocolate. This one I made with the Ghirardelli chocolate, which was really the best brand. It was a nice dark chocolate. You have to get these special wafers for your melting chocolate. You can't just take um, a bag of chocolate chips. It just doesn't work that way. <laughs> I wish it did. It's probably a little less expensive. This guy took about seven ounces of chocolate to make. He was quite, quite pricey, but this is for my husband. James said, um, you should have just bought a big block of chocolate and sculpted your own bunny. <laughs> I think this one turned out pretty nicely. So for making chocolate, you want to get a really nice mold that's really clean inside and doesn't have a lot of airspace showing through. This is my absolute favorite, favorite mold. And I probably did pay a little bit more for this one. You can buy these online. Like I said, you want to look online. You want to go on eBay. You want to go to a place called Dad's Follies. He sells nothing but chocolate molds. And although his prices, um, some of them are extremely high, you can also get some pretty good deals there. So that's called Dad's Follies. That's where I got a lot of my information on the chocolate. Now when you're out and about, you might find something like this. And you might think, wow, I just found a super fantastic chocolate mold. But this is not a chocolate mold. This is an ice cream or cake mold. These were invented before chocolate molds. And you, you can see that they will not have the same sort of details on the outside and even on the inside. Although these are highly collectible too, and it would be fun to make a little lamby cake over the spring. I think I might just might use this one for that purpose. The purpose for buying molds is for making chocolate. These are the kind of molds they started to make in the 1960s. And these molds are made of a hard plastic. They're affordable. They make absolutely beautiful little figures. I love these because they're very vintage looking figures. Here we have an exceptional rabbit made out of the plastic, hard plastic. And I think that these are probably a lot easier to use than the antique molds. Some of these plastic molds are just great. They're simply adaptations from the antique metal molds. I don't know, does this remind you of anybody? Hopalong Jack. This is Hopalong Jack. He's my logo. <laughs> I got the idea for him from an antique Easter card. One of my reasons for wanting to collect the molds was because I wanted to make beeswax rabbits. Now my friend Bunny Yes, that is her, really her name. <laughs> My friend Bunny has been making beeswax characters from molds that her husband inherited from his grandfather, who was a German chocolate maker. I think they have hundreds and hundreds of molds. And I've been buying her figures for years and years and years. So these were made from chocolate molds. 
but they are made from beeswax. And so this is something else you can do with your molds. All these little characters were made from chocolate molds using beeswax. This rabbit, James weighed it this morning, weighs seven and a half pounds. That's a lot of beeswax and that would be a lot of chocolate. Now you're going to ask me most likely where you can get these rabbits, but Bunny only does art shows, so she doesn't sell online. But I imagine that if you really looked, you could find some of these beeswax rabbits or make them yourself. In fact, we should do a video on making beeswax rabbits. I could try out my hand and I could actually use the beeswax. It is just amazing the variation of molds that were made. So here is a relief, which would have been a little chocolate bar, but in this case was made from beeswax by my friend Bunny. Another great use of your chocolate molds would be to make chalkware. Chalkware was very popular in the late 1800s as a collectible. Now this chalkware rabbit was made by an artisan from an art show. It was not made by me, but I do have all the plaster up in a big bucket up in my studio. I've just not gotten around to doing it. So it was made, poured into the mold. The plaster was poured into the antique chocolate mold. And then after it was dried, it was painted with acrylics and some sort of uh, protective was uh, put over the surface. Some protective sealant was put over the surface. So those are just a few of the things. I thought you might be interested in the chocolate molds. I think they're actually pretty, pretty fun and fascinating to see what you can do with them. And actually, I'm sorry this video went on and on and on again. I have a tendency to, to do that sometimes. <laughs> so sorry. I'll try to make the next one shorter. In the meantime, from Hopalong Hollow, this is Jerry, and thank you for coming. Bye-bye.